hello and welcome to the Slate Political Gab Fest. March 14th, 2024, the Did Her Exonerate Biden edition. I'm David Plotz of CityCast in D.C., but I'm in my new home. If I sound slightly different, we're just working out the kinks of my new pod setup. And if I sound better, great. If I sound worse, we'll figure it out. Uh, but hello from my new home. You sound closer. I feel like you're closer to the camera. Huh. Good point. I'm literally probably like about 100 feet closer to you than I was. So now I'm 243 miles and 486 feet instead of 243 miles and 586 feet. So maybe that's the difference. I could feel that in the bones of my ears. That is John Dickerson of CBS Primetime in New York City. Hello, John. Hello, David. And from New Haven, Connecticut, Emily Bazelon of the New York Times Magazine and Yale University Law School. Hello, Emily. Hey, David. Hey, John. This week on the GapFest, Joe Biden appeared before Congress and got feisty. Then a few days later, Robert Hur appeared before Congress and got sullen, whose appearance will end up mattering more. Then blue cities seem to be returning to more conservative, hard on crime policies. We'll be joined by criminal justice expert Jessica Brand to talk about whether this is a good idea. And then the House voted to ban TikTok. What will happen next? Could that become law? Should TikTok be banned? Plus, of course, we'll have cocktail chatter. And a reminder, we have a live show coming up in less than two weeks on March 27th, the Wednesday evening at 730. We're going to be live here in Washington, D.C. at the Hamilton. Uh, tickets are at slate.com slash GabFest live. It is going to be a really fun show. It's a wonderful venue. Wonderful, wonderful tight, close venue. We're all going to be up in each other's business, hanging out with each other. Uh, and it's coming at just about the most interesting time in the political season. So please join us on March 27th at the Hamilton slate.com slash GabFest live to get tickets to our DC show. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car, before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. We had some really good congressional spectacle in the past week. On Thursday night, last Thursday night after we taped, President Biden gave his State of the Union speech to a raucous, a raucous Congress. And then on Tuesday, special counsel Robert Hur, former special counsel, I guess he's back, he's a private citizen now, appeared before a very irate and skeptical congressional committee to explain to furious Republicans why he hadn't charged Biden with a crime for his mishandling of secret documents, and then explained to angry Democrats why he had so brutally characterized Biden as old and forgetful. So, um, John, let's start with her. What did he tell Republicans about why he wasn't charging Biden? And how, how did that go over? Oh, it didn't go over well at all. Um, but it, it didn't go over well in part because they didn't listen to what he was saying, or they didn't want to listen to what he was saying. Everybody was kind of using him as the bread that ferries the cheese, which is to say that like they were putting the cheese on the bread and like trying to get it across to the patron, um, but not really, you know, often paying attention to what he said. So how did they do that? They used him mostly to say, Mr. Herr, let me ask you a question about uh, this. And then they'd run, the Democrats would run like two minutes of Donald Trump shorting out at his rallies, which he does both when he doesn't mean to short out and when he just talks generally in this, you know, in the in the disjointed way in which he talks. And then they used him in a variety of other ways to repeat parts of his report that say that there's a material difference. And he reiterated this on him on his own, which is that there's a material difference between um, Donald Trump's response to the classified documents and Joe Biden's to remind people of that difference. Biden had a a significantly smaller amount of doc of um, of classified material uh, cooperated fully. Trump has significantly more. It's significantly more serious and seems to have 
participated in an escalating number of obstructions based on um, the indictment and also now on the testimony of one of the people involved who uh, talked to um, uh, Caitlin Collins of CNN this week uh, detailing the ways in which Trump um, ordered obstruction. So in the end, her defended his characterization of Joe Biden's memory, which is one of the things, back to your original question, David, that the the Republicans were most anxious to get him to talk about. And he um, reiterated it, although, and we obviously should talk about this, when the transcript was released, it's clear that Biden's memory wasn't as bad as her had characterized it, that it was, you know, not material because there's other stuff in the report where her says I didn't have the evidence to charge distinct from his ability to perform on the stand, which is why he said he had to talk about Biden's memory because it was important to determine whether a jury would find him credible. On that most important question, I don't think he had a great uh, day in his testimony. Can you can you talk, Emily, about this question about whether her characterized Biden's memory accurately based on what has been released? Did the supporting material materials tell us yes, he is a well-meaning old man with a poor memory, or did they tell us he's a, he's a person who, you know, occasionally slips up, catches himself, finds the the thing that he needs to say and continues? I mean, I think it was the latter for sure. I felt like reading the transcript, it seemed like hers, uh, characterization of Biden was ungenerous to the point of being really misleading. And, I especially felt this way about this whole thing of dates and in particular, the sensitive topic of the death of Bo Biden. So Biden said it was on May 30th. That's clearly like etched in his memory. And then this question of the year, you know, in general, when at least when I interview people, nobody ever remembers what year like it's like a yeah, I like I, I just had this myself. I had to rewrite my bio for the Times website, and I had to say how many years I had worked at the New York Times. I had no idea. I didn't know how many years. I didn't know when I started. I had to like go find something. Percent. A million. <laughs> I, I I was on a podcast not long ago, and I was asked when I had gotten married, and I'd said the wrong year. I totally believe it. It's just not how we think. Like, we don't think in terms of dates on a calendar. We think in terms of feelings we had, what else was happening around us. In the culture, you we all may remember that it has been the subject of many sitcom episodes or at least portions of episodes where husbands forget their anniversaries. I mean, it's like a thing where dates, even the most important in people's lives, birthdays are often this way too. Parents forgetting the Birth, birth dates of their children when their children have had no trauma and also the birth dates of their spouses. This is kind of like a thing. Yeah. And I think especially when you're interviewing people and they're kind of hopscotching through their lives and what happened when, like you just, I don't know, it's inevitable. I actually mostly when I interview people don't ask them the year that things happened because it is usually wrong and you just like set them on edge by asking a question they can't easily answer. And so it's much better to go figure it out later. Anyway, I thought it was just deeply unfair to Biden, and um, and it made me think of her as a kind of partisan hack who was pretending to be prosecutorial and doing his job with this report. And he, of course, defended himself along those lines, but it just seems to me like pretty indefensible. Once the transcript was released, we saw that her complimented Biden in the transcript on his photographic memory, um, which was left out. Again, it wasn't necessary in the in terms of charging because he said also in the report that there were other innocent explanations for Biden's um, having this material. Um, so that in other words, there were other reasons that he couldn't bring the case to its full conclusion that had nothing to do with memory. But we should note that the transcript did also show that um, Biden uh, didn't tell the truth when he uh, said he hadn't shared classified information with his ghostwriter. And the transcript shows that he struggled to find the words for fax machine and, and recall what years he was vice president. I'm not suggesting that validates the um, the conclusion at all for it's, all of the reasons yes. we've just said. But it's not like this was, you know, it's not like there was nothing in the transcript. Again, we should also remember this was an interview done right after the Hamas attack of the uh, 7 October. I mean, so there are a thousand reasons this was not um, as her um, presented it. And um, and I think the political damage is already done, however. Can we talk about that for a second? Like, there is something troubling about how long it took for this transcript to get released and the way in which this played out. And it's very reminiscent of how Bill Barr handled um, the Mueller investigation into Trump, where you have an explanation 
a, a presentation of facts with a lot of interpretation from prosecutors. And then the actual documents are withheld for some amount of time. And so the press understandably reports just the prosecutor's point of view and the refutation like might as well have arrived by, you know, pigeon. It takes so long to get to us in terms of changing the characterization. Like, I mean, don't you guys think if the transcript had been public when her came forward, that the whole story would have played out differently? That's a problem. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. But, but it's also the case, Emily, that you don't necessarily want prosecutors releasing all their raw evidence either. I mean, you do, if you're, you do, I, I mean, you, we want to rely on prosecutors to kind of take this mass of information and winnow it down to what matters to make it comprehensible and, and usable f- in, in the context of either prosecution or explanation. And so, so I'm not sure that dumping everything is the answer. Except I think that the pro- if you have a part a pros- if but that assumes good faith motivation on the part of a prosecutor. I mean, it also this is a very strange circumstance in which you have a long explanation for not prosecuting someone. Usually, prosecutors come forward and they say, "We are not indicting this person." They do not go on a long report and a long anything. And this is a you know function of our special prosecutor regulations, which I think we may want to be taking a very close look at because this whole thing is not working well. Right. Let's turn to that. So, Jack Goldsmith the legal scholar, um, widely respected legal scholar, argued that special counsels have kind of run their course. And his argument, if I could briefly characterize it, is that they can't be depoliticized. They've, they've, they are supposed to be out of the control of the attorney general, but also kind of under the control of the attorney general. And Goldsmith argues, like, it shouldn't be out of the control of the attorney general. Basically, the attorney general is this person who is deputized to do this work. And so you need th- this process to be under the control of the attorney general. And by putting them in this quasi in out state, you create all kinds of weird motivations where they're motivated to, you know, balloon their investigation where they, they are going to be accused of politicization no matter what they do. And the incentives for them are all wrong. So did you buy that argument, Emily? And that the, and I wasn't really sure what he thought the, the 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 next what what should happen instead that was that was I was unclear on because I don't know how you would have handled a Trump investigation in a Merrick Garland attorney generalship. I think what Jack is saying is that you the attorney general finds prosecutors to go run an investigation, but those people report directly to the attorney general in all the normal ways in this kind of quasi independence. I think what Jack was arguing is it's neither real independence because you are still a political appointee, but it also gives you enough running room that your boss isn't in control of you. And yes, it does seem from history, and we have a bunch of examples of this now, right? Going back to Ken Starr, although at that point the regulations were different, let's make clear, and there was more independence. But still, we have a bunch of examples now where just you start to wonder if special prosecutors are being overzealous in their prosecuting or are in other ways making decisions that just seem... Not great. And so the supposed benefits of this quasi-independence they have is not apparent. How do we wrestle then with the Mueller case? Because in that case, people would, I think, say he was underzealous and that the real thumb on the scale, either a thumb or all five fingers or palm or entire weight of the human body on the scale was was put there by the attorney general, by by the by Barr, whose report was a mischaracterization, according to the special counsel, of what was in the actual report. I mean, I think that if you want to keep playing out Jack's argument, he's saying it about that instance that it didn't work anyway. Like that because then Barr stepped in at the end and messed around, like Mueller's independence wasn't worth anything. So let's stop pretending there's this independence because it doesn't really provide a function. I mean, I, th- I think Jack is pretty critical of Mueller as well, if I recall. All right. Can we close on this topic actually by completely changing the topic? Just go back to the State of the Union, John. So the State of the Union taped after we recorded last week, so we didn't talk about it. But by many accounts, certainly the sympathetic accounts, a kind of bravura performance by Biden. Do you think this is the rare State of the Union that could adjust a narrative or or will it be the same sort of thermostatic polling? Or maybe it doesn't adjust a narrative, but it emboldens the Democrats to think, oh, we can put Biden in could overcome this 
frail old reputation if we get him out in the world because he did it at least for one night in this one circumstance. So what I would say is that I learned through hard experience and and having hot takes that didn't turn out to be right, that overzealous interpretation of presidential rhetoric is inconsistent with reality, which is to say political scientists have studied that when presidents talk, particularly in highly partisan times on an, on contentious issues, we shouldn't expect big movement in the polls. So one of the polls that came out, a national poll by YouGov, I believe it was, found there was no change in the head to head between Trump and, and Biden. I don't think um, any political scientist would find that exceptional. Um, now, that isn't to say that there isn't a lot of coverage that says, oh, my God, Biden didn't change the face of humankind after his State of the Union. And I, the reason I give you all that past history is I think that, um, you know, if you said it's not really that surprising that the State of the Union didn't change minds, people might think that it was a partisan point. I think it's just basically improved by political science. So then the question is, but does it matter in all these other important ways? And I think that it does. It certainly mattered in the fact that they set a single day um, fundraising record in the Biden campaign for themselves by raising $10 million after the speech. Um, I think that's a vote of confidence. They've already raised a great deal of money and to continue and being able to raise it on that suggests what you're saying, David, which is that this was probably a shot in the arm for Democrats. It probably lowers and it seems to have lowered the talk of people saying, can we have a situation in which Michelle Obama parachutes into the convention and then rides in on roller skates and takes over and gets the nomination and Donald that Trump goes so great. to the yeah. I want to watch that. I movie. think it I think it probably um d- deflates some of that, but it doesn't change the real challenges that Biden has in the seven battleground states that are going to determine the election where I think it was Bloomberg did some analysis that found that the economies in most of those seven battlegrounds, um, with the exception, I think, at least of Georgia and maybe another one, is a little bit worse, actually, than in the national economy. So we have to start thinking and remembering that we're talking about the voters, a small number of them, relatively speaking, in seven battleground states who are going to determine the election. And that's what we have to think about in terms of whether things impact and affect those elections. Thanks, as always, to our Slate Plus listeners. You've helped keep the gap that's going for so long. And you get so much great stuff for your subscription. You get bonus segments on every GapFest episode and every episode of lots of other podcasts at Slate. You get discounts to our live shows, like our live show coming up here in Washington. Uh, you don't hit the paywall on the Slate site. My Slate Plus membership seems to have expired without my knowledge, and I was very irritated to be like hitting the paywall at the Slate site, and it, it really it really provoked me the other day. Um, this week for a Slate Plus segment, We're going to be talking about marriage proposals. Are marriage proposals terrible? Do they need to be revamped? Marriage proposals. So if you are a member, again, thank you. Enjoy your membership. If you're not, go to slate.com slash GabFest Plus to become a member today. That's slate.com slash GabFest Plus. Part of the segment, John and Emily will both reenact their marriage proposals. So (laughs) you should stick around just for that. This episode is brought to you by SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI will not help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos. But it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia, identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real world results. That's SAP Business AI. This episode of the GabFest is brought to you by ZBiotics. There's now a game changing product to use before a night out with drinks. It's called ZBiotics. Let's face it, after a night with drinks, it's tough to bounce back the next day. You have to make a choice. You can either have a great night or a great next day. But ZBiotics is the surefire way to wake up feeling fresh after a night of drinking. ZBiotic's pre alcohol probiotic drink is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works when you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. ZBiotic's produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. Just remember to make ZBiotic's your first drink of the night to drink responsibly, and you'll feel your best tomorrow. Go to zbiotics.com slash GabFest to get 15% off your first order when you use GabFest at checkout. ZBiotics is backed with a 100% money-back guarantee, so if you're unsatisfied for any 
reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash GabFest and use the code GABFEST at checkout for 15% off. We are here to talk about criminal justice, criminal legal system reforms and what is happening to them in this moment. Um, and I'm so pleased to have with us Jessica Brand, who is a former defense lawyer who runs the REN Collective, an organization that does research and policy on criminal justice issues. Hey, Jess. Hey, Emily. To set the stage a little bit, we're in this moment in which we're recovering from a spike in homicides that um, really seemed quite alarming in 2020 and 21, but has declined significantly across the country, and yet not absolutely everywhere. In terms of other crimes, from my understanding, and you can correct this, um, other violent crimes kind of holding steady over the last decade or so, a sharp decline in a lot of forms of property crime, um, if you go back for like a longer trend, but a lot of attention to things like shoplifting and auto thefts and carjacking in particular parts of the country. And now maybe a kind of shift in democratically led cities or parts of the country toward reversing less punitive policies, or maybe you don't really think that's happening. I mean, it's always hard with these supposedly national issues where there's tons of local and state control to actually say what the national trends are. But what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a mixed bag. If you expect criminal justice reform to be linear, then sure, some of it's backsliding. But I think anyone who thinks that pushing back on mass incarceration is going to be linear is a little silly. Um, you know, you can look at some places like Oregon that rolled back some drug reform. You can look at other places like actually the cities in Texas during the last election cycle that voted really overwhelmingly for it in Austin and Houston, um, following races in Dallas and Bayer County. And, you know, Texas. Texas is a deeply red state, but the cities are still pushing for reform. So I think, I mean, I think it's a mixed bag and it's largely moving in the direction of, you know, people still want alternatives to incarceration where it's feasible. I think the problem, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, is elected officials aren't so good at showing what the, those alternatives would be. And so they rely on sort of the old forms of punishment when things get tough. I live in one of the few cities where crime has not really declined. I live in D.C. Things are a bit better this year, but the city feels profoundly less safe than it did four years ago. I don't think this is just Fox News catnip. It is a genuine feeling. There's a ton of car theft. There's been a ton of homicide. And there's just a kind of sense of car carjacking is outrageously high in D.C., uh, not just car theft. And I guess I'm curious, like, what you think in a city like D.C., the political figures should do when people feel really quite unsafe in a way that they didn't three or four years ago. Yeah, I was asking my buddies actually at the Public Defender Service in D.C., which is where I learned to be a lawyer, sort of what they thought about it, because fear is real. And I think elected officials and the reform movement makes a big mistake when they don't acknowledge that, when they say like, oh, it's not so bad. It is. People are afraid in D.C. and in a lot of other cities. People are afraid in Memphis. But the question is then, where do you put the money? What are the investments that you're making? And I think there's a lot of feeling that the mayor has not really led the investments in the right places since, during her tenure. Year, and there's been a lot of fighting in city council over where those investments, financial investments should go. And when you're not targeting the communities where crime is thriving in certain divested neighborhoods, you're going to get what you get in D.C., which is carjackings are up, murders are not declining at the same rate they have in other places. And that's kind of the predictable result in a place like that. Can you say just a little more about what those investments should be yeah, I mean, look, and I think this is why you don't see them very often, because they're harder to explain to the public other than saying, you know, higher mandatory minimums or more prison or more jail. But, you know, if you go into, I'm going to take Philly for an example, right? If you go into Kensington, Philadelphia, it is really dangerous there. And there's needles everywhere and there's a ton of crime. There's also a ton of research out of Penn that shows if you actually cleaned up those neighborhoods and greened them a little bit and put up lighting and put in some parks, you'd see a decline in violence by 
30%. That's not nothing. Like that's a pretty cheap investment. I'm not saying like fix all the schools, which is not going to happen tomorrow. Just put down some grass, put up some benches, put up some light. You actually see huge investments. And this is validated research that you see a lot of. We talk a lot about putting incredible messengers into the streets, people with lived experience who can actually spend time reducing violence, mentoring kids, that actually works. Now, it only works if you have sustained investments, right? So what happens is we'll spend money for a couple months, maybe a year, then we stop spending money. And then what do you know? The program dies and violence goes up. So those are sustained investments you have to make in the communities. But they really are actually quite effective. Or helping young Black men who are victims of gunshot wounds. When they leave the hospital, they're much more likely to carry a firearm. Why? Because they don't feel safe. So if you catch them there and give them social workers and help them to feel safe and help with that trauma, you actually... It's, this is like not rocket science. You see reductions in the possession of firearms and then you see crime go down. But we don't really make those investments in any sustained, coordinated way for a long period of time in the places where we know crime is going to thrive. And then we act surprised when crime actually thrives in those places. Just were you saying that that had happened in Philadelphia or that that's what should happen? Because didn't Philadelphia see a drop in crime relative to, say, D.C., which saw that uptick? Yeah, I mean, Philadelphia, obviously, during the pandemic had a huge spike. It was all over the news. It was, you know, there were parts that were really dangerous. And the city council did a pretty good job. And the mayor did a good job really investing in violence prevention issues. Now, they need more. But there's a lot of those validated studies, in part because you see also huge research universities there putting money into it, of what is the effect of catching people as they come out of the ER with a gunshot wound? What's the effect of investing in those neighborhoods? And that's where a lot of that greening research comes from. That's what a, where a lot of the violence interruption research comes from. Also out of Chicago, they saw huge reductions when they invested in those things. This is not really a question exactly. It's more an observation. Um which is, again, I'm talking about D.C., but I am also talking about other cities I've been in. I think one of the things that when it comes to cities and a perception of crime and and safety is that cities just feel quite different than they did pre-pandemic in all kinds of ways. And it's not that they're better or worse. It's just like different, that, that lots of places that used to be crowded are not crowded. Some places that weren't crowded are now crowded because like where pat patterns of, of, uh, you know, sort of more suburban areas and cities are more crowded because people are not going into downtowns. And so kind of some certain areas are being worked in and that people's activities have moved to suburban areas. I wonder if there's some element of the perception of, of crime that has to do with just the feeling that the city is a different lived space than it was four years ago. And people haven't change their mental map of their city to reflect that so that they when they go to a downtown and it's like why where are all the people i don't like that there are no people here they haven't realized oh that's the new norm and i just that's just how it's going to be i think yes and um i don't want to understate you know the impact of fentanyl and sort of what that looks like on the streets you know if you walk into downtown san francisco i mean it's visible, and the Tenderloin is a scary place to be. You don't want to be hanging around there in the evening. Um, I was just there. We were, I was ha- going to have dinner with a very lefty friend, and we thought, you know, we're going to go someplace else. Now, that doesn't, again, mean prison and jail is the right answer, which is where they seem to be headed. But the visibility of that, it is different. It's I think it's rightfully scarier for people. And then, of course, there's the house, unhoused population that's also increased Um you know, during the pandemic and as rents get higher in some of these cities, Austin, San Francisco are great examples of this. And because we haven't solved those problems, all of that is much more visible. So I think, yes, the downtowns are not as crowded as they used to be, but also just some of the problems that sprung out during the pandemic and with these new wave of drugs are just, they're scarier for people to see and they want a solution and officials aren't great at giving them. What do you make of the efforts toward decriminalizing hard drugs in Oregon, which now the state legislature is rolling back. It seems like one thing that happened was that the decrim happened before they really had a whole network of social services and drug treatment in place to catch everybody. But I have to say in reading about it, you know, it sounded like what they did was they went from if you were picked up for hard drug possession, instead of a criminal charge, you would have to pay a $100 fine unless you went into treatment. And it didn't sound like that turned into a real funnel for treatment. Is there something about losing the consequence of the criminal charge that is actually a problem separate from not having enough social services in place? I mean, all the research would say no. 
that, um, you know, criminal charges is, especially when you're talking about addiction, is like totally useless. Um, that's not what's driving addiction, especially not with hard drugs, right? Hard drugs are, you know, it's really hard to break an addiction to fentanyl. And people aren't thinking, oh, well, I'll stop using fentanyl because I might get arrested on a misdemeanor now that's going to put me in jail for 180 days versus I'm going to get a ticket. That's just not how people think. Um, so it seems like, yes, again, you know, Portland's an example. You go downtown, there's a big problem there. What do we do? Oh, this is a hard thing to do. We're going to do the knee jerk thing. It's like when the doctor hits you on the knee and you, you know, kick your leg out because that's the response. Like this is everybody's response is, oh, this is hard. So we'll go back to the thing we were doing before. But the notion that the 180 day jail sentence or whatever it's going to be, I think maybe it's shorter than that, is going to break someone's addiction and solve this problem that they're struggling with to me seems a little bit silly. And in fact, it's going to make it worse, right? Because when you go into jail and you have an addiction, your likelihood of relapse and and dying when you go out because you've been in relapse is, a, is huge. Jess, we're in a, a political year, so this is all going to get mangled in, um, in both the ways that people talk about crime and then, as you said, the the response from politicians in a year where they're where staying in office is is up in the air is going to cause them to have these knee jerk reactions. And we have this cr- crazy Gallup figure that said not crazy, but actually maybe totally understandable Gallup figure that says 77 percent of Americans think crime rose last year, even though all the evidence suggests that murder declined um, and maybe it declined in the single largest one year decline ever. So when you think about this and you, you already did this with us when we started, how do you frame this issue, since it's going to be talked about a lot, that both um, acknowledges people's emotions, acknowledges that it's up in some places, but keeps people from rushing to the knee-jerk reaction or keeps people from just saying, how dare you, um, you know, contradict my feelings, which are that I'm unsafe. Can you give people a way to think about this issue in an election year that will be kind of a shield against the possible demagoguery and misinformation and kind of over-emotionalism? First, what you said, you have to acknowledge people's fear. I mean, the media has done a bad job of telling, especially TV news, of telling people what the reality is about crime, but that's what we're living with. It is what it is. We can't do anything about it. So yeah, Democrats have to acknowledge people's fear, but I think they have to get right to solutions that actually work. People want those things. It's not like voters don't want robust treatment. They want interventions. They want their streets cleaned up. They want all of those things, but we're not good at communicating those things. And I think Democrats for a long time have said, well, we're going to invest in jobs and we're going to invest, you know, we're going to end poverty. And that sounds, people want something that will work right now. It's like a triage solution, right? How are you going to triage the problem that I'm faced with? Fixing school sounds great, but that's a 25, 50 year solution. What are you going to do right now? And there are real things that can be presented to communities, but they have to say them. They have to articulate them and not be afraid of those solutions. Cause you know, all the polling kind of shows that those things are quite popular when people are told about them. They're just not told. When I write about this, I always find a challenge to be that there is one or two words for the punitive answer, right? You say policing, or you say prison, or you say tough on crime. And there is no one or two words for the alternatives you're talking about, right? Greening, lighting, um, violence interrupters, credible messengers, like we just, they're not familiar in the same way. And it's always just a challenge because the word alternatives doesn't convey the content of the alternatives. Yeah, it's also not in our DNA, right? I mean, prison and jail is just like, it's in everybody's muscle memory. So you're combating that. I mean, I think the other things Democrats could do a better job of is calling out the other side for their total failure to solve these problems. I mean, who was president during the crime spike? It wasn't Joe Biden. It was Donald Trump. I mean, where is crime really high? Well, in a lot of red states that are run by Republicans who are divesting from communities or who, I mean, in Texas, everybody where I live, everybody has guns. So just, we're all wandering around with guns while school shootings happen. And we're not great at naming that very often. Um, We always feel like we're on the defense about it. And the other party is not solving crime in any meaningful way. They've never solved crime in any meaningful way. They just want to lock up homeless people and people who are suffering from addiction. And I think we're better off when we name that that's what's happening. Jessica Brand from The Ren Collective, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Okay, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. 
This episode of the GabFest is sponsored by Home Chef. Are you drowning in a sea of meal kit options, feeling like you're in a bad dating game where every contestant looks the same? Fear not, friends. Amidst the chaos, there is a one shining star worth your culinary affection, and that's Home Chef. I'm right now in this wonderful phase. I've been away, so I haven't I haven't gotten my Home Chef meals yet, but I've been browsing the website. I've been looking through it. I've been contemplating which of these incredibly delicious looking meals I want to have. And that moment of anticipation is delightful. And I can't wait to report back next week on how good they were. But for the moment, for the moment, I'm living in the state of delighted anticipation because Home Chef is amazing. And that's because Home Chef provides fresh ingredients and chef designed recipes delivered right to your doorstep. And it's economical too. Home Chef customers save an average of $86 per month on groceries. That is a lot of savings. For a limited time, Home Chef is offering GapFest listeners 18 free meals, plus free shipping on your first box, and free dessert for life at homechef.com slash GabFest. That's homechef.com slash GabFest for 18 free meals and free dessert for life. Free dessert for life. Homechef.com slash GabFest. You must be an active subscriber to receive the free dessert. This episode of the GabFest is sponsored by Unpacking Israeli History. You're listening to the GabFest, which means you almost certainly care about history. And we're living through an extraordinary period right now, and especially when it comes to the situation in Israel and Gaza. And you're hearing a lot of loud voices screaming about genocide, about massacre and occupation. But these words and slogans and headlines are not enough to understand what's happening over there. And that's where unpacking Israeli history comes in. Unpacking Israeli history covers the topics that are relevant to what's going on in Israel today. From the history of infamous terror groups, Hamas and Hezbollah, to the story of Nakba, to Israel's disengagement from Gaza in 2005, there's so much to uncover. Unpacking Israeli history cuts through the noise and helps you understand Israel's present through understanding Israel's history. So educate yourself, learn the history behind the headlines, and find Unpacking Israeli History wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode of the GapFest is sponsored by SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia and identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations, so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. The House voted overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, to ban TikTok this week. Not exactly a ban as written, but it effectively would compel the company, which is a subsidiary of a Chinese company called ByteDance, to be disgorged to an American entity, or it would be barred from platforms. This comes after about four years of inflammation about TikTok, where legislators and a lot of others have questioned if if ByteDance is likely to share user information with the Chinese government to use propaganda, either subtly or overtly, to sow discord in America or advance Chinese causes. So, Emily, the the ban TikTok movement was kind of quiet and then suddenly just sort of erupted, mushroomed up in recent weeks. What What is it that has caused Congress, bipartisan group in Congress, and the Biden administration to move so quickly and so emphatically towards this, uh, this ban for tic- of TikTok? Yeah, the wildfire part of this is really striking. I mean, there has been this evidence for a while that TikTok is more pro-Chinese in its content and more like inflaming American division in its content than other major platforms. So like, for example, um, there are researchers at Rutgers who found that um, videos about things the Chinese government objects to, like Tibet and the Uyghurs and Hong Kong protests, are strangely hard to find on TikTok. This is from a piece by David Leinhardt in the New York Times. And then on the other hand, that there's like more kind of sympathetic to Hamas content on TikTok and less sympathetic to Israel content than on other platforms. So you have this 
fear that this Chinese entity, which the government, the Chinese government seems to have influence over, is like deliberately um, affecting Americans' political views based on the content that it's promoting and providing. And and this is happening through a supposedly kind of frivolous app that's like for kids where people are just watching fun videos. And so they're not even going to be realizing that they're be like uh, receiving this um, fountain of propaganda. If that's the case, then I guess it's understandable that you would want an American or at least uh, an American or European, a, a sort of allied um, set of owners to take it over. But this just seems so bananas to me that we're going to force the U.S. is going to force a sale of this enormously valuable entity. I mean, apparently there is I didn't realize this. there's precedent for this. We did this with Grindr, which was owned by a Chinese company, and we forced a sale um, to other owners. But there's just something so um, wrenching about this intrusion into the private sphere. I'm just having trouble getting my mind around it. Just to note, so there is this CFIUS Committee for Foreign Investment in the U.S. Is it, you know, a legitimate function of the U.S. government that's been active for a long time? And the idea is that you do not want to let, you know, you do you wouldn't want to let uh, the every nuclear power plant in the United States be owned by the Taliban, like a Taliban investment entity. You would that would that seems like that would be a bad idea. So you might bad, prevent you might prevent that from happening, and and so there is a. There's a pretty broad national security authority for the government to decide that companies that are in national interest, uh, that are or that that have sensitive information, that have sensitive IP, that have huge impact on the U.S. economy, needed to be owned by certain kinds of entities. And so, I think that seems reasonable. I guess the question is whether TikTok is different than a nuclear power plant nuclear power plants <laughs> yeah and then that question becomes there is what is um carried along by tiktok that just happens to be mischief makers creating mischief on tiktok and then what the annual threat assessment said which was and this was the director of national intelligence avril haynes saying that there is evidence that chinese specifically linked to the chinese propaganda arm had targeted candidates and political parties during the midterm elections of 2022 and they expected them to do it again in 2024 there are two groups of one is directed by china um interference and as other is interference that china is perfectly happy to have exist out in the world but that they not may not be the initiator of you got to figure those two things out. And then the other thing I think that struck me is FBI Director Christopher Wray has been going on at some length for like more than two years. And the cybersecurity and infrastructure security head has also been making this case that basically China is in American infrastructure, has been for five years, basically sitting and waiting that if there became a crisis that they would, um, you know, destroy power lines. Um, shut down hospitals, attack U.S. infrastructure. And so if they see China doing that, the 170 million Americans who use TikTok um, are a kind of ripe target that China could pretty quickly affect in a moment of crisis to really, by the time you got your hands around it, it would be too late, I guess, is the concern. I, I 100% believe that China is in the U.S. infrastructure and could cause enormous damage if they want to. And I don't think it's beyond the realm of possibility. In fact, I think it's entirely likely that a lot of things that we perceive as hacks that are damaging U.S. infrastructure right now are, are in some way orchestrated by Chinese or Russian or North Korean or Iranian uh, interests. I think that's, but it's also the case that the U.S. can do the same thing to China and to Russia and to North Korea if they choose. Like the, 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 in, the next war, if there's a global war, will be primarily a war of messing with other people's internal uh, infrastructure and internal technology. I, that's my, that's David Plotz's prediction. You're right. But it, but using your Taliban analogy, you wouldn't say, well, then it's okay to have the, I mean, it, just because that's no, going to be. No, no, war. you wouldn't say it's okay. But I guess the question is whether TikTok is, whether TikTok is the right place to uh, make a stand and the right place to prevent this from, from spreading. Like, is TikTok a big enough deal? I mean, I guess I get, where I get weird about it is that it feels to me that TikTok compared to American platforms, social media platforms, TikTok seems actually much less dangerous to me than Facebook does, than WhatsApp does, than Twitter does. Like in if you want to think about things that are disruptive 
for the United States and socially destructive for the United States. I think we're doing a pretty good job with American made social media platforms doing doing all the all the damage that China could want to do with TikTok. We're doing quite well on our own. Well, those things could be both true at the same time, right? Yes, I mean, this is like the discussion sure. over Russian influence in the 2016 and 2020 elections. Like, well, <laughs> they could have been meddling. And yet also there was all this divisive and inflammatory material from within. So did they did we even need any help like messing things up? You know, another issue that comes up here is the antitrust concern about having fewer major platforms. I mean, one of the good things about TikTok is that it has eaten the lunch of Facebook slash Meta um, and YouTube, which is owned by Google. And that's like healthy form of competition. And so if you do imagine the sale going forward, presumably the Biden administration is not going to let Microsoft or Google or Meta buy this platform, and they shouldn't. But it, there is that part of the picture as well. One thing that the Chinese government said is that this was an act of bullying by the U.S. and that it would come back to bite the United States. TikTok in its current form in America is not allowed in China. I don't think Facebook's allowed. I mean, there's already, um, so it's not like they could shut things down that they've already shut down in China. But there are ways in which U.S. companies, Tesla, Apple, rely at the very least on the Chinese um uh, consumer market, if not, you know, regulatory forbearance by the Chinese government that they could, you know, turn off uh, in, re in retaliation for this. So this could, distinct from the cyber uh, issues, could lead to a tit for tat that would be quite messy um, in economic terms. I'm one of those people who, like, long past the time when it seemed, when it seemed sensible, I was always like, we need cooperation with China, we're going to grow together. It's like, co-prosperity. And I believe I kept believing that, you know, like I believe that till last week, practically <laughs> now, everybody else has came to the conclusion. No, these two economies kind of need to be disaggregated from each other. They need to be separated from each other. And, but the, but the issue of course, is that there are these extremely important companies with extremely valuable IP and extremely valuable products that have a huge amount of their production in China and Apple and Tesla being two of the biggest ones, but not the only ones. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know how that they, they are Apple and, and Tesla and, and Tesla related companies are so beholden to China and are so respectful. There's this incredible details about how Apple, when Apple makes products for its TV, when it's making TV shows, they have told creators who are making TV shows for Apple not to have anything critical of China in their own TV shows, which are running, which are never going to be shown in China which have nothing to do with China, which have nothing to do with the Apple products that are being made in China. But it's Apple is so fearful of a Chinese response to a, a, an Apple TV show that, that criticized China that they are telling people not to do it. John, what path does this face in the Senate? Is this going through in the Senate or will just they slow walk it and it'll die? Yeah, there's the institutional sludge reason, which for as fast as it moved through the House, um, and it is quite extraordinary how fast it moved through the House relative to how slow even the basic functioning of government moves through the House or doesn't move at all. Anyway, the Senate's only um, working, I think, three out of the next six weeks, um, and they've got spending and judicial stuff to work on. So they've got – there's other things to work on. That the, and uh, Rand Paul has suggested he will do everything he can to block this. You'd need 60 votes. There are – there's a kind of left – far right coalition that has uh raised up against this legislation that might get you um you know f to 40 donald trump has said that he after having previously tried to block uh tiktok he now doesn't want that to happen which led to talk about a tree falling in the forest and nobody hearing it mike pence wrote a um essay for fox that said that trump had been turned by lobbyists and uh and a, a um and one of his donors, who is a $14 billion, I think has a $14 billion investment in ByteDance. Um, and that basically that Trump was um, totally captive of the swamp on this, like a double, a twofer, right? Captive of the lobbyists and captive of the big donors. And he said, too, Pence wrote, too many politicians talk a big game, but crack under the pressure of wealthy donors or personal grudges. In this case, personal grudges being against Meta. Trump said, you know, don't be mean to TikTok because it will empower Meta. And Pence blame Trump for this kind of behavior. And it, 
you, I mean, in 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 a other political universe, a vice president attacking a, their former president would kind of matter, especially on a shiny object story like this. And I think the fact that I'm saying this is like going to be news to 99.9 of the people who are hearing this. Yeah, I mean, Trump's reversal is really quite <laughs> astonishing. I mean, it doesn't it's not astonishing in the sense that anyone who's ever studied Trump for a minute knows he, he's an entirely transactional person. And in this case, it seems like Jeff Yass, who's this multi-billionaire who owns a huge stake in ByteDance, ingratiated himself with Trump, as did and Kellyanne Conway seems to have been part of it, and then some other people in Trump's close orbit have have lobbying connections where they're probably getting some form of indirect payment from ByteDance or Yas or something. And lo and behold, Trump uh Trump happily reverses this almost a signature position that he had from his presidency. Which were from executive orders during his presidency, which got reversed in court. Let's go to cocktail chatter. When you're sipping a drink through a thin reed, uh, useful as a straw, you're sipping something, Emily, what are you going to be chattering about? Something super wonky, David. The um, Judicial Conference of the Federal Judiciary changed the rules for judge shopping this week. <laughs> John we did a whole segment on. with, with uh, Jessica Levinson on this last night on the show. So, you know, I'm just totally down with you. So proud of you. Yeah. So this is basically um, a way of preventing certain litigants from seeking out a few extremely conservative Trumpy judges, particularly in Texas. Texas had this quirk where you could file a lawsuit in a court that was a division of a federal district, and you would be guaranteed the judge in that court or division, who just happened often to be Judge Matthew Kaczmarek, who's um, issued these nationwide injunctions in cases like about immigrants remaining in Mexico and um, distributing abortion pills, etc., uh, and so the Judicial Conference as a whole decided that now you have to file your c- case with the whole federal district so that there will be some um, randomness in which judge you get. Jeffrey Sutton, who is the judge who's in charge of the Judicial Conference right now, is a quite conservative Republican nominee to the bench. Um, and, you know, he's behind this. It seemed like it was a pretty popular decision among the judges nationally. But a couple of federal judges in Texas, um, Daniel Ho and Edith Jones, immediately came out and um, fumed against the decision and said that it actually contradicted a federal statute and that it was itself political. So it's just interesting that there would be such outspoken opposition to what seems like it could have been a kind of sleepy bureaucratic move, um, but is itself really political. And yeah, I mean, this whole move toward nationwide injunctions is something that's been quite controversial. And clearly, the judiciary is trying to put the brakes on it. John Dickerson, what's your chatter? My chatter was going to be about <clears throat> how um, high school wrestling, uh, girls high school wrestling is the fastest sport, fastest growing sport in America. It's extraordinary how fast it has mushroom. There were like 100 national female high school wrestlers like 10 years ago, and there are 50,000 now in Philadelphia in 2020. There were no high school wrestling teams. There are now 180 high school female wrestling um, teams. It's Imagine a- young Emily Bazelon growing up in Philly- Philadelphia. Would you, you, you could have been a raging, she would have been ragey, rangy. So you're very tall yeah. for a wrestler, Emily. Sure. It probably- wasn't really that tall. And well, I guess by high school. Yeah. I mean, when my son was wrestling, there were girls on his team and on other teams. And so, and they competed against the boys. And that was like really interesting to watch that and how everybody handled it. Um, so maybe, John, there's now a move toward all female wrestling right. teams in high there school. Is, that is, yes. And um, that was true um, when uh, Bryce wrestled as well. Um, but anyway, I, but then I got distracted by the fact that it is um, Pi Day as we tape, and I was um, uh, by I was introduced to this uh, person uh, by Morning Brew, which is a, a favorite newsletter uh, that I read in the morning. And this is the um, world champion of Pi memorization, and his name is Akira Har- Haraguchi. And in twenty in two thousand six, he recited one hundred thousand digits of Pi from memory at a public event in Tokyo. It took him sixteen hours and thirty minutes. Now, as all of you know, and I bet David has um, uh, some wonderful fact about Pi because he's a man of numbers. Um, pi is totally p- follows no pattern, yeah. and so to memorize one hundred thousand digits. Um, 
is an extraordinary feat. But not in a good way. Well, <laughs> not in a way that seems valuable to the humanity. Well, so in this interview in The Guardian with Mr. Haraguchi, he talks about, um, first of all, how did he do it? He basically created a language um, assigning numbers to syllables, and then he told himself a series of stories based on those sil- syllables. So 800 different stories um, whose characters are mostly animals and plants. Um, and one of the lines from the stories reads this, well, I, that fragile being who left my hometown to find a peace of mind is going to die in the dark corners. It's easy to die, but I stay positive. So first of all, kind of trippy. Second of all, for him, it is an act of Buddhist meditation. And his day exists, I mean, he basically for an hour a day recites about 15,000 digits as a kind of daily meditation. All right, I, w- I withdraw my derisive comments, but but I still maintain them slightly. <laughs> you just are less vocal <laughs> about them. Uh, in a true move from the sublime to the trivial, my chatter, my chatter is really, it's it's like as trivial a chatter as I could imagine, which is that I, so I just moved. Moving is terrible. And last time I moved, Gap Vest listeners gave me some advice. And one of the pieces of advice they gave me was to try a service called Lendabox, which is a local service here in DC, but I think it has various national chapters. And I, I want to endorse the concept of Lendabox as firmly as I endorse any concept in the world. And the idea of Lendabox is when you're moving, instead of uh, getting a whole bunch of cardboard boxes or having somebody else get a whole bunch of cardboard boxes, they will deliver a week before you're moving or two weeks before or a day before a bunch of plastic bins with good handles on them, well-constructed. And you can pack in these bins, which also stack beautifully. There are dollies you can stack them on. They have dish dividers so you can pa- pack your dishes in them as well if you need to and your glassware and it takes this process is extremely ugly and you know taping up boxes and 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 they give you labels so you can label it into you know where it's going and you pack in these plastic boxes the movers when they came and they saw that i had lenda boxes were like practically practically fell over themselves in relief because they're very easy to carry they're extremely well, the they handles great must make ergonomic handles right? yeah And it also forces you to unpack because you can only keep the boxes for a week after you had them because they, you return them. And so it just forces you to get everything out of the boxes, which is a great forcing function compelled you to unpack. And then they're gone and you don't have to deal with recycling them. You haven't wasted anything and they're back and someone else is using them. It is an incredible service. Lend a box. (laughs) Oh my God. I'm, I'm signed up even though I have nowhere to move. I think I still have one of those from when I moved. (laughs) Time at Time Magazine in 2005. You have a late (laughs) fee, John Dickerson. You better be paying that now. It's like your library fee. I I I I couldn't agree more. Um, It's really true. All right, listeners, you have great chatters. You have emailed them to us at getfestslate.com. For which, gracias. We really appreciate it. Keep them coming. Uh, Something that you were talking about, probably less uh, trivial than my Lenda Box chatter. And our listener chatter this week comes from Steve in Queens. Hey, this is Steve from Forest Hills, Queens. I decided to reread Robert Caro's The Power Broker, the epic biography of Robert Moses that will take you down plenty of avenues and diatribes. One such path landed me on the New York Times Time Machine page, checking out an announcement of a property sale. The date of the publication was December 31st, 1924. On the Times page, another story caught my eye with the headline of Soon Finds Mother for His Five Children. The story goes on to say, quote, William Schoenfeld of 10 Metz Avenue, Winfield, Long Island, who two weeks ago told Justice George J. O'Keefe that he would be married before the end of the year in order to provide adult care for his five small children, produced a brand new marriage certificate in court yesterday and announced that he had become a Benedict for the fourth time. The story goes on to list the name and addresses of six women who wanted to marry him and how Schoenfeld hopped into his fliver to meet the women, a fliver being a cheap car. Embedded in the silliness of six women soliciting to marry a 40-year-old widower, someone hopping into his fliver, and the usage of the word Benedict is a story of a man trying to keep his children with him. I don't know if William was a good guy or not, or if the marriage ever worked out, but I hope it did. And I hope the kids found a nice new mother. That 
That's our show for today. The Gap Fest is produced by Shana Roth. Our researcher is Julie Hugan. Our theme music is by They Might Be Giants. Ben Richmond is Senior Director for Podcast Operations. And Alicia Montgomery is the VP of Audio for Slate. For Emily Bazelon and John Dickerson, I'm David Plotz. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week. And please come to our live show in D.C. on Wednesday, March 27th. Get tickets at slate.com slash gabfest live. Lucky Land Casino. Asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.